Hello, it's my pleasure to join you today at the virtual symposium on radiation safety in computed tomography. My name is Andrew Einstein. I'm Victoria and Esther Abudi Assistant Professor and Herbert Irving Assistant Professor at Columbia University Medical Center, where I work in the Department of Medicine's Cardiology Division and the Department of Radiology. My first talk today is entitled, Effects of Radiation Exposure from Medical Imaging. How good are the data, and why is it important to tailor studies for the clinical questions to minimize exposures? These are my disclosures. The entire session uh, which we're participating in today is really focusing on detrimental effects of ionizing radiation in medicine, but I think it's important to preface this with, with a brief mention of the tremendous benefits that radiation involving imaging involves. Improvement in diagnosis of our patients, improvement in prognostication, the ability to affect medical therapy, guide interventions, and ultimately what's most important to improve patient and societal outcomes with imaging. While radiation has its deleterious effects, a clinically important diagnosis, which is provided by many of these computer tomography and other radiologic exams which we perform, is really priceless in terms of its value to our patients. Over the course of this talk, I'm going to begin with a discussion of radiation terminology, then discuss radiation doses from common procedures, discuss the evidence of cancer risk at radiation doses that our patients receive, uh, and uh, how good this data is, discuss risk models and their limitations, and close with, with a discussion of seven reasons why, why it's important for us to tailor our studies, so-called patient-centered imaging. So fundamentally, there are two types of damaging effects which can occur from radiation. Those are classified as tissue reactions and stochastic effects. Tissue re reactions, which are also called deterministic effects, are due to radiation-induced cell death or cell damage, whereas stochastic effects are due to mutations. Tissue reactions typically will only occur above a particular dose called a threshold dose, and that's generally high only after a large proportion of cells in a tissue have been affected by radiation. This threshold may vary from individual to individual, and the severity of tissue reactions can increase with dose. Examples of this are things like skin and hair changes. You can see in the illustration here, a patient had a serious skin burn due to radiation from a fluoroscopically guided procedure. In general, in computed tomography, we don't see tissue reactions. However, in the past couple of years, uh, there, there have been a number, in fact, uh, a few hundred cases reported to the Food and Drug Administration of tissue reactions from CT, particularly uh, hair loss uh, and skin erythema. Here's an example where, where one hospital inadvertently exposed patients to relatively high doses of radiation and patients had uh, severe reactions from that. In contrast to tissue reactions are stochastic effects. These are generally due to radiation-induced mutations, and their severity doesn't depend on the dose. They're stochastic, which means probabilistic, either it occurs or it doesn't occur. Uh, the most common type of stochastic effect is a cancer, a neoplasm. Uh, th these will generally occur only after a latency period, which for solid tumors will be at least five years, and for leukemias, at least two years. Another type of a stochastic effects are hereditary effects, which occur much less frequently than neoplasms based on our current epidemiological evidence. The typical effects which we're concerned about in diagnostic imaging are stochastic, and a common assumption is that risk is proportional to dose at these low doses. How can we quantify the amount of ionizing radiation which our patients receive? This also introduces a number of terms. Fundamentally, there are two different types of uh, of ways which we can quantify radiation in terms of a risk, which is a probability of a deleterious effect, for example, cancer incidence or cancer mortality, or in terms of dose, which is a more direct measure of the effect of radiation on, tish, on uh, tissue or on, on a patient. Dose is a measure of energy deposition in matter. The, the most common uh, or, or the most fundamental type of dose is an organ or tissue absorbed dose, which represents the concentration of energy deposited in that tissue. That's measured in units typically of milligray, where one gray is a special term for one joule of energy per kilogram of tissue. What we see used commonly in the literature is something called effective dose. 
effective dose is a doubly weighted measure of the amount of energy deposited per unit mass. That's weighted, firstly, to reflect the type of energy, and secondly, to reflect the relative radio sensitivity of each organ. Summed up over all organs, that defines the effective dose. An effective dose is measured in terms of another special unit called the millisievert. In addition, we have modality-specific measures of radiation. For example, in computed tomography, we have something called the dose length product. Where does this come from? Well, it's, it's derived from measurements which are made in specialized dosimetry equipment placed in specialized phantoms. Uh, we, we'll use something called a pencil ionization chamber and, and use a special CTDI or CT dose index phantom, perform measurements, and from that we can calculate the dose length product, which reflects both those measurements as well as the length irradiated. Our scanners do this for us, and they'll estimate a dose length product, and, and that will be provided typically with every patient's examination. We can estimate effective dose from this dose length product by multiplying by a conversion factor. More about that later. Now, what are typical effective doses uh, by way of reference for some non-medical sources of radiation? For example, a chest x-ray is associated with an effective dose of about 0.2 millisieverts. If I were to fly from New York to San Francisco and be with you in person rather than be with you virtually, uh, my round-trip flight would be associated with a typical dose of about a tenth of a millisievert or five chest x-rays. Uh, the radiation dose from the backscatter scanner in the airport is much less than that, but the background radiation to the U.S. public, which we're exposed uh, to uh, from natural sources, is actually much higher than a chest x-ray. It's about three millisieverts. So when we talk about dose in terms of number of chest x-rays, uh, it can be misleading because we're all exposed to a, a chest, a, a chest x-ray or a few chest x-rays worth of radiation each week just from natural background radiation. Some uh, radiation workers can receive much higher doses. In terms of uh, common nuclear medicine and computed tomography procedures, typically these, these are on the order of 1 to 20 millisieverts, although they can vary. Uh, some procedures are associated with higher radiation doses. Uh, for example, CT scans of the head, in general, uh, will have much lower radiation doses than CT scans of the chest. Uh, what's an important piece of information to keep in mind, and I think one of the biggest contributions of our uh, uh, chair of, of this uh, scientific program, Dr. Smith Bindman, is that the range of radiation doses uh, from computed tomography varies markedly uh, between patient and, and one patient and between institutions. For example, here's data from Dr. Smith Bindman's group from four institutions in the San Francisco Bay Area who were scanned uh, a few years ago. You can see radiation doses ranging from less than a millisievert to close to 100 millisieverts from computed tomography. It, it varies depending on the, the procedure, but also depending on the particular scan of that procedure. In addition to the variability between scans and the high doses some patients receive and lower doses other patients receive, it's important to remember that, that radiologic testing can be layered or sequential. Uh, numerous patients uh, receive multiple procedures involving ionizing radiation. What do we know about the cumulative doses that, that they receive? What I'd like to talk about now is three studies addressing cumulative dose of radiation. The first of these studies uh, is from the Brigham and Women's Hospital, where Dr. Sodickson and his colleagues uh, looked at it, all patients undergoing CT at their hospital in 2007 and went back over a 20-year period to identify all diagnostic CTs that they uh, had performed. This involved over 30,000 patients, about half of them women, and the average age was uh, 57. The effective doses of radiation were estimated on the basis of the particular region of the body scan. So it wasn't patient-specific uh, dosimetry, but it still provides a rough approximation. What did Dr. Sodickson and his colleagues find? Well, their typical patient undergoing a single CT scan underwent a median of three and a mean of six CT scans at their hospital alone. 1% uh, of patients received at least 38 CT scans. Uh, you can see the skewed distribution uh, in the figure here. 
in terms of radiation dose, this was skewed as well. The, the average patient or the typical patient un, underwent a median, uh, uh, received a, a median cumulative effective dose of 24 millisieverts and a mean cumulative effective dose due to the skew of 54 millisieverts. 1% of patients had radiation doses of at least 400 millisieverts. So what lessons can we le learn from this study? There are high rates of recurring, recurrent CT imaging, and procedure counts and cumulative radiation doses from CT are highly skewed. Another study, a larger study, looked at medical radiation exposure in a large insurance cohort. The data source was claims data from United Healthcare in five comparable markets across the United States, Arizona, Dallas, uh, Orlando, South Florida, and Wisconsin. Uh, and the investigators in this study, led by Reza Fazel, uh, looked at all enrollees who were age 18 or above, but non-elderly, who were continuously enrolled over a three-year period. Cumulative doses were classified as being either low, that is less than one year's background radiation, moderate from that amount to the average annual worker limit of 20 millisieverts per year, a high uh, up to 50 millisieverts per year, which is the maximum one year worker limit, or very high above that. These are averages over the three year period from 2005 to 2007. Nearly a million subjects were enrolled, about half of them women, and the, and the patients were on average uh, on the young side with an average age of 36. There were over 3 million imaging procedures uh, considered, uh, and about 69% of subjects in this insurance cohort had at least one imaging procedure involving ionizing radiation over the three-year period. What did we find? Well, uh, about 20% of patients underwent uh, received moderate average doses uh, annually of radiation. About 2% of patients received high doses, and two-tenths of a percent of patients received very high doses. Where did this radiation come from? Well, CT uh, was five of the top indications. Actually, the single procedure with the highest radiation dose to, to patients was myocardial perfusion imaging, but right behind that was abdominal CT, pelvic CT, and chest CT. Uh, Interestingly, there were significant differences between different uh, groups in terms of radiation exposure. For example, women received higher radiation doses than men. Elderly patients received higher radiation doses than younger patients. And individuals in Florida received higher radiation doses than individuals in Wisconsin. What lessons can we learn from this study? Well, most adults get some imaging involving ionizing radiation. High and very high doses, uh, as, as defined here in this particular context, are less common, but they still translate to 4 million non-elderly Americans receiving at least 60 millisieverts over a three-year period. There are higher cumulative doses in women and with decreasing age, with, I'm sorry, with increasing age. There are differences between geographic regions, and CT and myocardial perfusion imaging account for most medical re, uh, imaging and most medical radiation. A third study which complements this study was performed by Dr. smith Beinman and her colleagues. This looked at me medical radiation not in an insurance cohort, but in the context of integrated healthcare systems. They, they looked at members enrolled in one of six healthcare systems, uh, which are part of the HMO research network, and there were a number of important differences from the study of Fazal et al. Uh, this, this involved integrated systems rather than a private insurer. Uh, procedure doses here were imputed, uh, assuming a truncated log normal distribution. There was a longer follow-up period. This was from 1996 to 2010. Uh, and patient dose here was looked at on an annual basis and not cumulated over years or averaged over years. They, they found about 1 to 2 million enrollees each year. And uh, there were over 30 million imaging exams performed over a 15-year period. 35% of these, about a third, were, in, were involving advanced imaging, that is CT, MRI, nuclear medicine, or ultrasound. You can see here uh, the trend in the types of imaging exams performed by modality and, and year. Computed tomography in this insurance cohort in the upper left here uh, grew steadily and markedly over the period studied. 
as did magnetic resonance imaging. Nuclear medicine was flat and in fact tailed off towards the end. However, that didn't include PET imaging, which was considered separately, and the volume of PET has been growing dramatically uh, recently. Where did this annual radiation dose that patients receive come from? Well, it changed over the study period. In 1996, about 30% of the annual per capita radiation dose was from computed tomography. By 2010, that was over two-thirds of the radiation that patients were receiving in this uh, HMO research network cohort. How were per patient radiation doses? Well, uh, about 6% uh, of patients received between 3 and 20 millisieverts uh, on average per year. 2% uh, uh, of patients received between 20 and 50%, and a similar amount of, of patients received an average of over 50 millisieverts per year. So what lessons can we learn from this study? CT is growing in HMOs and varies between systems. Uh, its use varies between systems uh, from 136 to 200 exams per 1,000 enrollees in 2008. Uh, and the rates of util utilization increase even in this setting where there's not uh, per se a profit motive to perform more CT scans. So we've looked at typical radiation doses from radiologic procedures and we've looked at the effect of multiple testing, cumulative radiation doses uh, to patients. Putting it all together, it looks like we have multiple studies which demonstrate that the high burden for ma medical radiation to the U.S. population is growing and not evenly distributed. Rather, dose distributions are skewed and a smaller subset of the population receives a higher dose of radiation, and there are gender, racial, and regional differences in this radiation burden. So with this in mind, this, this sense of the radiation burden, uh, which is not equally distributed, that our our patients receive, what evidence is there of cancer risk at the levels that at least some of our patients receive? Well, it, it's difficult to uh, answer this question. There are a number of properties of the ideal epidemiologic study for which, which would, uh, from which one could draw conclusions about cancer risk from computed tomography. Ideally, since most of the people who are exposed to CT are adults, it would be a study of adults receiving a medical exposure relatively low doses because that's more generalizable to the, the general public which doesn't receive such high doses of radiation. It would involve a, an acute, not a chronic exposure. It would be, for statistical uh, reasons, a cohort study rather than a case control study, and it should have adequate statistical power. And the last one is the real kicker. That, that poses a challenge. This work, deriving from a report from the National Research uh, Council, uh, demonstrates the sample size required for adequate statistical power uh, as a function of radiation dose. How many individuals uh, we'd need uh, in an epidemiologic study to detect a significant increase in cancer mortality uh, in that cohort, uh, assuming lifetime follow-up. As you can see, when radiation dose uh, is uh, 50 milligray, uh, that, that would translate to 100,000 individuals in a study. If it's lower, uh, the, the number of individuals required for adequate statistical power is even higher, uh, a million or more. So it's difficult to have such large epidemiologic studies uh, with such long follow-up. Uh, however, we, we do have some epidemiologic data uh, which uh, addresses and, and bears light on this, on this issue. In particular, I'd like to talk about four different studies. Studies of Japanese atomic bomb survivors, of nuclear industry workers, of in utero x-ray exposure, and of pediatric computed tomography. You can see these check boxes. None of these uh, four studies or, or sets of studies which we have meets the criteria of the ideal epidemiologic study. Each meets it in some respect, but each is, is deficient in some respect. So we don't have the perfect study, at least not now in 2013. The atomic bomb survivors were, were studied in the context of the lifespan study. This has been a huge undertaking, and it's a joint effort between the Japanese and the United States governments, uh, conducted by uh, what's now called the Radiation Effects Research Foundation. Uh, the lifespan study uh, characterized 120,000 individuals for whom we have pretty good dosimetric uh, information about. How does this study work? 
Well, I'm going to provide a, a simplistic approximation, but in general, individuals who are within 2,000 yards of the hypocenter, that is ground zero, typically receive radiation doses of over 100 millisieverts. Individuals between 2,000 and 300 yards, say, uh, received most commonly doses between 5 and 100 millisieverts, and together these uh, individuals are called the exposed cohort. These individuals are compared to the, uh, those individuals who have radiation doses of less than 5 millisieverts who are referred to as the non-exposed cohort. Those are people who were further away from the hypocenter or, or lived in Hiroshima or in Nagasaki but happened to be out of town uh, on that day. Uh, in any event, if we look at this 5 to 100 millisievert group, that is the orange ring, they constitute 65% of the exposed cohort. They received a mean dose of 29 millisieverts, and they had an excess relative risk of developing cancer of 2%, which was statistically significant. Where does this come from? Well, uh, if we look at the total number of solid cancers observed in this orange ring, there were about 4,400. If we look at the number of we would have expected projecting from the uh, a non-exposed group, we would have only expected 4,325. They're in excess of 80 cancers. This 80 into 4,000 or so comes to 2%, and that's where that 2% excess risk derives from. Another source of data is the 15 country study of cancer risk in radiation workers in the nuclear industry. This looked at over 400,000 radiation workers with 5.2 million person years of follow-up. These individuals had a media, median radiation dose of 19 millisieverts, and they had an excess relative risk of about one cancer per sievert. This was statistically significant. Its 95% confidence interval didn't cross zero. And at a dose of 19 millisieverts, this would translate to about uh, 0.2 excess cancers per individual. In other words, about 2% of the cancer deaths in the cohort could be attributable to radiation. Another source of data is the Oxford Survey of Childhood Cancer. This was a case control study looking at all children dying of cancer in the United Kingdom at the age of less than 16. Uh, they were, this was a case control study, not ideal from an epidemiologic point of view, and it involved over 15,000 case control pairs. The relative risk of cancer in cases here was about 1.4. Reviewing this study, the Oxford Survey of Childhood Cancer, as well as several smaller studies also looking at childhood cancer from x-rays, the late Sir Richard Dahl, arguably the greatest epidemiologist, epidemiologist of the 20th century, concluded that on the balance of evidence, uh, the irradiation of the fetus in utero increases the risk of childhood cancer, and that an increase in risk is produced by doses of the order of 10 milligray. So what data have we seen so far? Atomic bomb survivors, radiation workers, in utero x-ray exposure. Three distinct cohorts, all exposed to doses uh, of less than 30 millisieverts, which are very common for our patients uh, to receive, and all demonstrating a statistically significant excess relative risk of cancer. That's where things stood pretty much about in, until about a year ago when really a groundbreaking study was published by Dr. Mark Pierce uh, from the United Kingdom and, and his colleagues. Uh, this study, which was published in The Lancet, uh, was a cohort study of patients without previous cancer diagnosis who first underwent computer tomography in Great Britain between 1985 and 2002. They looked at these individuals at all CT scans which they had performed on them through 2008, and they assembled this cohort from the radiology information systems at 81 National Health Service regional services across the country. They linked this with their National Central Registry for Cancers, and then estimated radiation doses from UK-wide surveys of machine settings, which were combined with Monte Carlo simulations. The first report, the publication last year, focused on leukemia and brain cancer, and they assumed a two-year lag period for leukemia and five years for brain cancer. The study included approximately 180,000 children who collectively had about 280,000 CT scans, about two-thirds of which were CT scans of the head, hence the interest particularly in brain cancer. What did they find in this study? There was a relative risk of uh, three times uh, uh, for developing leukemia for individuals who received at least 30 milligray from their CT scans. 
this was statistically significant. And leukemia risk was positively associated with radiation dose to the, to the red bone marrow. Brain cancer risk in this study uh, was, statist was statistically significantly increased for individuals having at least 50 milligray, and it was positively associated with radiation dose to the brain. There are a number of other cohort studies uh, which are going uh, on as, as we speak. In fact, there's another study which is in press and may well be published by the time uh, this lecture is, uh, is shown uh, in May of 2013. Uh, but in any event, uh, these studies incorporate several million individuals uh, and a pooled uh, analysis is planned. So I think over the next decade, we'll learn a lot more. But already, the, the Pierce et al. study teaches us a lot more about radiation risks from CT, particularly in the pediatric population. Now, with this epidemiologic uh, uh, evidence base, how can we translate this to estimating radiation dose uh, to our patients? The, the best framework for doing this is in the context of the U.S. National Academy's BEER-7 report. BEER is an acronym, not for the beverage, but for biological effects of ionizing radiation. And th there have been a series of such BEER reports. Uh, the BEER report uh, contains a comprehensive review of the available data, which supports the linear no-threshold risk model, uh, and develops most the most up-to-date risk estimates for cancer from exposure to low-level ionizing radiation. Now, this was published in 2006, so it doesn't, for example, include the data from the Pierce et al. study. It was, however, based at the time on a comprehensive review and synthesis of, world, of the world literature on radiation epidemiology, and the models which it develops relate organ doses to organ-specific cancer risks. So how can we determine the organ doses to our patients? Well, we can do it one of two ways, either computationally or, or by actually measuring it. We have computational tools as well as physical radiation dosimeters which we can use uh, so that we can estimate radiation doses to individual organs from a particular scan. Then we can plug those organ doses uh, into uh, the, the models derived by beer and estimate cancer risks to individual organs. In fact, that, that's been done in a number of uh, popular publications. This is one study from my colleague David Brenner at Columbia, which estimated cancer risk from pediatric computed tomography. And as, as you can see, uh, CT performed in a, in a child uh, is associated with much higher can estimated cancer risks than CT performed in adult. Uh, my colleagues and I uh, estimated CT associated cancer risk from coronary CT angiography a few years ago. And as you can see here as well, cancer risk is highly dependent on patient's gender and patient's age. There are a number of limitations of such cancer risk, estima risk estimation uh, approaches. Fundamentally, they reflect phantom cancers in phantom patients. Uh, and they're subject to the assumptions and uncertainties of the beer model. For example, a lot of the data which went into beer derives from the Japanese atomic bomb survivors. That entails transporting uh, the, the, this data uh, from a Japanese population to an American population where there, there are different baseline cancer rates. It, it entails accounting for differences between x-rays and other types of particles. Uh, and there are a number of other assumptions which go in, into beer. So it's important to keep in mind that uh, th these estimates may be useful tools, but they, they are that, that they are just estimates. I'd like to close with seven reasons why it's critical uh, to tailor our studies to our patients. Uh, we, we've seen that at radiation doses which our patients receive, the epidemiologic evidence supports an increased cancer risk. And by virtue of tailoring the radiation, uh, uh, tailoring the, the study, we can minimize radiation uh, and, and keep it, patients' exposures as low as reasonably achievable. So what are seven reasons underscoring this? Firstly, uh, what we've seen is that there's tremendous variability in the radiation doses that our patients receive. Uh, the, the study from smith Beinman et al. Doses for a single procedure ranging from 10 to 100 millisieverts. If we can keep the dose to our patient down, we can minimize our patient's cancer risk. Number two, uh, real-world radiation doses are higher than those in published studies 
uh, which oftentimes evaluate cherry-picked patients scanned using the newest equipment at expert centers. If you look at the, the latest publication in the cardiology literature, in the cardiac CT literature, uh, there, there's been great work uh, in, in Germany demonstrating that you can perform coronary CT angiography uh, using a protocol with a radiation dose of a tenth of a millisievert. This is from Dr. Uh, Schubeck and Dr. Achenbach and, and their, their colleagues. However, this study only involved 21 patients. They were very thin the, with an average BMI of 23.9 less than the vast majority of patients who I scan, uh, in, in New York at least, and these patients had ideal heart rate conditions. They were scanned at an, opt at a, at an outstanding set, uh, at, at an outstanding center with outstanding uh, radiologists uh, and uh, state-of-the-art equipment. So under those circumstances, it may well be possible to conduct such scans. But if we look at real world, world performance, uh, or even performance in the context of clinical trials. Uh, the, the latest study, uh, multi-center study evaluating computed tomography was the Rami Cat 2 study that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine several months ago. This compared patients with acute chest pain who underwent coronary CT angiography with those undergoing standard evaluation. Uh, in a thousand emergency department patients with, with chest pain at multiple centers. Half of those patients were randomized to CT coronary angiography, and in that study, the mean effective dose of radiation was 11 millisieverts, two orders of magnitude higher uh, than in the, the paper from Germany. So while it may be possible, in principle, uh, for patients to have very low radiation doses, in practice, th this benefit is not available to the vast majority of patients undergoing computed tomography. An another reason for concern, we may well be underestimating radiation doses. What we call one millisievert may not, in, in, in fact, be one millisievert. As we discussed before, uh, these estimates of radiation dose typically come from the, the dose length product, uh, which is reported by our CT scanner. We'll multiply that by a conversion factor, typically conversion factors which derive from European guidelines, and estimate the effective dose from that. Well, how are these k-factors, these conversion factors, determined? They're determined based on Monte Carlo simulations of CT scanners. But if you dig into the literature, the, these Monte Carlo uh, simulations were performed quite a while ago using scanners which no one uses today. The Siemens DRH, GE9800, and Philips LX, all single-slice scanners uh, which really uh, very few hospitals in the United States are, are using anymore. Moreover, these k-factors, conversion factors, derive from a previous definition of effective dose. And often they're applied to scan protocols which don't match those to which they're applied. For example, using a chest conversion factor for a cardiac scan. So, uh, if we, in fact, if we look uh, in the literature, th there are a number of uh, publications now uh, which empirically determine proper conversion factors for cardiac scanners. All of these demonstrate conversion factors which are considerably higher than those used in practice. So when we estimate radiation dose, we may well be underestimating that dose. Another reason why it's critical to tailor the study of the patient, we, we may or may not be underestimating risk. Remember, the, the study from Pierce et al. published in The Lancet last year. How, do, how does this data compare to the Japanese atomic bomb survivors? In fact, this was addressed in a, in a recent publication of the National Council on Radiation Protection and Measurements, NCRP. This NCRP report found that direct comparison with the atomic bomb survivor uh, would indicate risks in the Pierce et al. study that are over 20 times higher in this medical circumstance than from the risks following the detonations at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. However, and rightly so, Pierce et al. make comparisons with regard to the age of exposure and time after exposure and conclude that while the risks were higher for their CT population, they were statistically compatible with the atomic bomb survivor data. So maybe atomic bomb survivor data if anything, underestimates radiation dose. There are different interpretations uh, of both of these sets of data, but the, the jury is still out on this one. Another reason why it's critical to tailor the study to, to the patient uh, is that even if the radiation dose to the patient is very low, if it's in a, an inappropriate study, that's too high a dose. And in fact, if we apply a study widely and, and multiply a very small risk by a very large uh, population, that can still translate to many cancers. One illustration of this is the shape guidelines. 
Uh, this is not a set of guidelines not offered by uh, any of the major uh, radiology or cardiology professional organizations, but more an ad hoc organization, the SHAPE Task Force. And they propose uh, population-wide screening of all individuals uh, w within a certain age range, except for those who are very low risk, with an atherosclerosis test. Generally, that would be a, a coronary artery calcium scan. Uh, my colleagues in, at the National Cancer Institute and I performed some uh, calculations to estimate the cancers which would be caused if 50 million Americans, as proposed by SHAPE, were screened with calcium scoring, even using a, a, a respectable dose of about 2 millisieverts. And we found that 5,600 cancers would be caused by this. So even though it's a very low dose procedure, if it's not appropriate, it shouldn't be performed. If there's no clear evidence supporting uh, that it improves outcomes in, in patients, there's the, there's the uh, concern that if translated on a population basis, we can cause a lot of cancers. Another reason why it's critical to tailor the study of the patient is that many uh, tests are unjustified uh, and inappropriate. Uh, in fact, there was a study uh, which I'll talk more about in, in another lecture in, in this conference, uh, looking at 47 sites in Michigan and evaluating the appropriateness of coronary CT angiography. They found w w without any intervention at baseline, only about three out of five study CT scans, coronary CT angiograms, were appropriate. The other two out of five were inappropriate, uncertain, or unclassifiable. And a final reason why it's critical is and probably the most important one. We have interventions that can lower doses and consequently cancer risks, decrease variability, and improve appropriateness for our patients. This will be the subject of many subsequent talks in this conference uh, aimed at particular applications, but by virtue of, of lowering doses, decreasing uh, unnecessary var variability, and ensuring that all studies are appropriateness, are appropriate, we, we can reduce this radiation burden to patients. So in conclusion, medical imaging undoubtedly has many benefits. Many patients, however, receive high radiation doses from medical imaging, and the available ev epidemiologic data, while imperfect, suggests an increased cancer risk at these doses. We can estimate this cancer risk, uh, and there are numerous reasons why we should tailor each study to the patient and, diag and to the diagnostic task. Uh, what we refer to as patient-centered imaging. With that, I'd like to thank you for your attention uh, and open up the discussion for questions. Thanks so much.